So hi, I'm Mike James, your host for today's podcast. I'm an LTA master performance coach and coach educator and mentor and collaborator in the Chilton Institute of Learning, Development and Sport, or CHILDS for short. And I'd like to wish you a very warm welcome to the very first of our CHILDS podcasts. Our aim through this podcast is to inspire our listeners to win through learning and sharing by a series of interviews and conversations with individuals and organizations throughout the Chilton area from a variety of different disciplines, most commonly with a sporting link. Winning, of course, in this case requires some definition. And for us at Childs, it's simply to develop ourselves, our organizations and our people to better our best on a daily basis through adopting a deep childlike curiosity to learn. Childs has grown out of our work here at Holton Tennis Centre, where I'm Director of Tennis. So it only seems fitting that our first podcast is an interview with the architects of really what has been an amazing sporting and business recovery, from nearly being boarded up and shut down in 2000, through growing into what now many call one of the finest examples of a tennis centre in Great Britain. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce and welcome Holton Tennis Centre's CEO, Nick Layton, and Chairman of the Tennis Centre's Board, John Walker. Welcome, gents. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Looking forward to it. Yep. Thanks very much. So, Nick, I'd like to focus really today for our listeners on what John often refers to as the Holton Project, which has been ongoing for the last 20 years or so. But I was just wondering if you could give us some context in terms of history of Holton leading up to the turn of the century. Of course, Mike. No, not a problem. <clears throat> well, the history of Holton uh, is quite an interesting one. Unlike um, many places, it's very, very old. It, it comes about 100 years old. We celebrated, I think, in 2006, yeah. our, our century as a site, as a sporting site. Yeah. Um, and we've actually very fortunate we've got some lovely old photographs and pictures that we, we managed to cobble together that are in the clubhouse. But back in the old days, it was uh, started off as a cricket ground. There was no tennis here. Tennis didn't exist. I'm not sure, Mike, you'll probably know when tennis started in Wimbledon, but this is 1906. Had it started in those days, do you know? It had just. In the late 1800s, Wimbledon had uh, kicked off and um, was going. But uh, okay. no, it's fascinating that it was a cricket. It was a cricket sort of ground pavilion. It was. The clubhouse as we know it was a was the pavilion for the cricket. It was a very basic one. Um, and the, the tennis courts that we know out the front were, were a cricket ground. Um, so that was the sort of 1906 era. And it belonged to a, a very wealthy gent it's called Rothschild, Lord Rothschild, which yeah. people may have heard of. Um, and then World War One came along, uh, as we know, 1914, and the era of RAF Holton was born, and, and the airplanes, and it became a massive recruiting site um, mm. in, in that that era. And the courts, as we know it, uh, were actually greenhouses and, and farm allotments and so on. And as we've been doing building work over the years, we've discovered a lot of foundations of outbuildings and what used to happen uh, there, because clearly they had to feed themselves. There were no supermarkets, no Tesco's. Yeah. So the, the thousands of troops that were there, billeted there, and training to go off to war, had to be fed and all fed locally. So we were a massive farm, really. It, it yeah. became a farm at yeah. our, our site. So that's the kind of history of World War One era. And then after the war, it became what they called the RAF Officers Tennis Club. I'm not sure how. We haven't found out how it suddenly morphed into that. Right. But it yeah. turned into grass tennis courts. I can, similar to Wimbledon, and in 1929, a very select group of RF officers set up this little club with uh, three or four courts um, and the pavilion in front of it. And it kind of stayed like that for a long time until the 1950s, until after World War II, um, a national service came into being. Um, and suddenly we had a lot of fantastic standard tennis players winning our club champs, but at the same time as playing at Wimbledon. So That's it was right. a bit bizarre. Yeah. So our honours board, we found out all the old winners from the from the archives. Reads like a bit of a hoo hoo of the 1950s of people who were the best tennis players in the world, including the, the referee of Wimbledon for years, Alan Mills. That's right. So yeah. 
all, all a bit all a bit strange in those eras. Then obviously national service was phased out, and the, the club, the RF Officers Club, just became a general RAF tennis centre. Yeah. Uh, in the sixties and seventies, um, and it was just. Um, rattled along in its own sweet way, lovely grass courts with the groundsmen and everything else, very similar to the Wimbledon, very, very high quality. And then there was a major change in 1979, some entrepreneurial RAF chaps came along with a massive Chinook helicopter and dropped a big bubble, a big indoor centre in 1979 on what was the vegetable patch. <laughs> Nick, was, what, was that one of the first indoor bubbles in Great Britain? It was the first, the it very was. first. Yeah came from the Netherlands, I think it was, or somewhere like that. I'm not quite sure, um, but from Holland, I think it was. Um, and the locals weren't quite sure what was going on. This massive white bubble suddenly appeared and questions were asked in Parliament about this. I'm planning <laughs> where the hell had it come from? What was going on? Because we are, of course, a little village. Yeah. You know, this huge thing uh, arrived. So that was that sort of started the, the transition to indoor tennis at Holton and uh, Obviously, it's the, the jewel in our crown these days, but it's it came about with a lot of people. And we had a lovely old guy who was in his 80s come around the other day for a walk called uh, Brian Rowe. And yeah. he remembered helping erect it when the shirt came up in one summer in his shorts back in 1979. And he was reminiscing with us of how they did it. And oh, fantastic. All the rest of it. So that was a very interesting COVID story that happened a couple of weeks ago, funny enough. Yeah, yeah brilliant. So that was uh, indoor tennis starting. And then, unfortunately, as we now know only too well, indoor tennis is extremely expensive to run and maintain. Yeah. And it's one thing buying it and sticking it in. It's another thing maintaining it and keeping it going and paying the electricity bills and so yeah. on. Yeah. So when we read the minutes back in 2000 on what actually happened there, it actually indoor tennis caused quite a lot of grief for everybody. And within a couple of years, they uh, they discovered that they had to open it up to a wider audience to help pay the bills. And that's when Holton Village Tennis Club started in 1983. Right. So uh, we've been going as a, as a village club, like every other club in the country, since 83. And we were just a tenant. We, we literally came along and hired some courts and, um, from the RAF as, as a tenant uh, for all our club tennis and matches. And occasionally we were allowed indoors as well. Um, but at that time, the RAF were quite big and had a lot of matches, 20, 30 matches a year and all their tournaments. So we kind of worked together a little bit uh, in that side of things. But the finances were very much a struggle for everybody. And as mm. public finances started to, to bite and trouble, you know, getting enough engine uh, oil and petrol for their engines for the aircraft, clearly things like an expensive tennis centre went right down the priority list. Yeah. And that kind of brought us up to that point where investment wasn't going into the center things weren't being maintained and repaired and the village tennis club members were starting to leave and drift away and it became a little bit of a um lose-lose situation um because clearly the club membership were providing the cash the hard cash to keep things going and it kind of it worked well for a while but um tennis is a hard sport as we've learned to, to make it financially pay and I think we'll talk about it later maybe, but the five, six court clubs, not the end of the world, such as a COVID, um, but the big ones that come with a lot of expenses to run. Um, and we're kind of a bit like a David Lloyd in size, you know, five acre size with a l size, a lot of tennis courts. It's not cheap. Um, yeah. And that's what everybody yeah. discovered and why in 2000, the, uh, the workmen were being uh, signed up to come and board the place up. Yeah. Yeah. So that, does that give a bit of a feel for Nick? That's absolutely fantastic. Years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what, what, what a fascinating history, really. So just to really summarize, then in 2000, things weren't looking um, so rosy for us. And uh, John, that's when you and Nick really decided to team up um, to see if you could kind of turn this thing around. W would you mind just expanding and talking a little bit about that, please? Yes, well, um, I had joined uh, Holton, my wife Vicky and I had joined Holton um, probably about 1995, I think. So we'd been there a few years, Vicky more than me. Uh, she plays more than I do. And um, so we, 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 we got into the club, we got to enjoy it, um, had a lot of, uh, lot of great friends there. We'd moved to Wendover 
from Whitchurch up yeah. in the North Bucks. And uh, it was it was brilliant to be able to go down to the local tennis club and make some friends and, you know, be part of the local community. Um, and I happened to, de- I decided at, in my mid fifties to, to move away from my, uh, my, my key job as chief executive of a quite a significant company and start to do other things. I yeah. thought, you know, I've done enough of that. I want to see more of the children. Uh, I want to help other people to build businesses and build that, you know, you know, coach them and help them to, to, to develop. And that was my passion at the time. And since then I've been doing a lot of that, as you know, uh, and, um, then, you know, I discovered from Vicky initially that the club was in trouble because she was on the committee and then Nick uh, arrived on the scene. I think, I'm not quite sure, Nick, I think you were, you were a consultant at the time working in a consulting business, weren't you? That's that's right, John. I was a, I was a member of the tennis club, and yep. having an air force background, I'd played here for many years back in the nineteen yep. eighties, yep. and then became a village tennis member. Yep. Um, but literally, all I did was come here and play tennis. I hadn't yep. a clue how it all worked, yep. um, and so on. Yes, yep. I was out there doing business consulting after spending okay. a bit of time in in, in that sort of world. Yep. Uh, wondering what to do next with my life. So yep. I think it was about forty at the time, a bit younger than you, John. <laughs> well, let me think. Let me think. Uh, hang on a sec. Uh, we're going back to 19, 2000. Yeah, I would have been fifty-five. Yes, no, uh, I was thirty-nine. So oh, there okay, we go. Okay, okay. Yeah. But, you thought uh, my side. <laughs> it was a bit of serendipity, Mike, really, because I I was in a situation where, to be perfectly frank, I wasn't very keen on getting involved uh, because I'd I'd learned through Vicky about. Um, uh, tennis committee politics and all the barriers and problems, and it, it wasn't. It didn't sound terribly attractive, but anyway, she 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 dragged me in, and then and then Nick and I uh, struck up a relationship, a friendship, and uh, with the t- with the extra bit of time that I had, and I love the game, as you know, and I think we'd, you and I had already met Mike when you were at Holton a few years earlier, and you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I'd I'd had a, a previous stint at two stints at Holton, hadn't I? So you I did, you did, yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah, and we remember that uh, with a great affection because that was really what started us off. We um, we we originally joined another club, which was incredibly dysfunctional and unfriendly, and it certainly gave me an idea of how not to do it. Yeah, and in yeah. fact, if we were going to get involved, as we eventually did, I did eventually did. Uh, then we had to be exactly the opposite to that particular club that we joined. And we had to be much more focused on customers and being friendly and warm and so on and so forth. So that's how it all happened. So Nick had time on his hands. I had time on my hands. Uh, I was looking for things to do and uh, we got together. And, um, and then I think we, we recruited you, Mike, when, when we were in a bit of a mess and we asked you to come and join us when we were uh, basically bust. Remember that's that. right. That's that's yeah. right, John. And uh, actually, both of you painted a, a heck of a picture at the time in terms of actually how how exciting it could be. And and you know, we often talk about you know the definition of an adventure, which is kind of outcome unknown. And uh, you know, signing up to um, you know breathe life back into this kind of fairly dilapidated old tennis center at the time you know was 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 really really attractive to me and of course the last 20 years have been you know a really really significant time of growth um, for us and development Um, so Nick I was just wondering if you might sort of share the last 20 years just in some numbers um, just to guide our lis- listeners to the extent of the work that's taken place. And then perhaps, John, we could unpack that a little bit to see how that's actually happened. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, there's a lot of numbers. So I'll, I'll sort of stick to the headline ones. And, yeah, and then, as you say, mm. people can um, take it from there. Um, but I start with the cheapest one, Mike, and that was you. <laughs> because I remember, I remember it actually only cost us a bacon butty to get you to sign up. <laughs> I was too <laughs> you were, easy. Yeah. You were too easy. <laughs> so yes, back in two thousand, um, the numbers looked pretty stark, and and you could set, you could see why we weren't providing any income for for the tennis centre. We had about one hundred and fifty members and fifty juniors, so fairly small numbers for what was a big big site with lots and lots of tennis courts and of course three indoor courts that yeah. nobody else had you would imagine that um we would be attracting a lot of people to come play tennis here uh, that clearly wasn't the case um 
we now have, by contrast, 700 um, regular playing members, juniors yeah. and adults. Um, so we've gone from 200 to 700 uh, over that period. And one of the reasons it's not even more is partly allocation, where we are, um, tucked away, but also the quality of what we what we offer. You know, we are now moved into something that's, that is high quality um, and a good standard as such. And we discovered that when later on when we put the second dome in, people are strange characters and they don't naturally move tennis clubs once you belong no, somewhere. Right. Yeah. You don't, so it's not about um, having something bigger and better for somebody. So our client base with the RAF camp wrapped around us has always been fairly limited on terms of pure members. So we're pretty comfortable with 700 um, going up there. Second number that, that jumped out at me um, was our gym. We, we, we started with no gym, of course. Nobody had a gym. Nobody had heard of gym. So there was zero figure there. And uh, we now have 450 members. And yeah. Of course, that's a fantastic revenue stream for the centre. And we'll come on to the concept of multi-income streams and the bankrupt nature of a tennis club as a concept. Yeah. Um, we had one coach, a part-time coach that, that was working here, um, who also had another job, obviously. And now we have 15 yeah. Now, that's a big number yes. in terms of the finances, and it gives you a, an indication of the amount of coaching there is now, and that people yes. who want that that service, probably more than most, if not all, tennis clubs in the UK, but also a great rental income stream for the centre. So it sort of goes round in, in a nice circle to have money to improve the courts, etc., the facilities. Um, we have... Within the gym, we had zero trainers and physios and sports massage. We now have about 10 people working full time in there across all those those different disciplines of the gym. And then within the catering, we started off with a part time barman uh, working there. But we now have something like six to 10 people, including bar staff, yeah. working, including yeah. a chef. So about 50, we've gone from about one and a half people <laughs> at the start, bless them, to over 50. Over 50 people actually earning a living here, full-time, wow. part-time, plus obviously the knock-on effect, as John would say, to the families. We're, we're, we're a pretty big employer in the local area. No yeah. two ways about it. Yeah. And again, I don't know many tennis centres um, that, that can uh, talk, talk about numbers in, in that scale, um, particularly where we are. We're not in a big city centre. We don't have a, a massive audience to play with. We have to work very hard to attract those sort of numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So, sort of backing up some other uh, other numbers, um, schools, we weren't involved in any school tennis. We're now operating about 10, as far as I'm aware. Mike, you know the, the detail yeah. better than me, but 10, 10 plus schools. Disability tennis, again, didn't exist when we started. We're now providing that service to over 400 children and adults every year. Big summer camps for them, big festivals of tennis, as well as groups, disabled, um, Down syndrome groups, visually impaired. So yeah. we've, we've yeah. really made a big change in terms of numbers over the 20 years. Um, and then facilities, and that's probably one of the things that obviously catches people's eyes, it's very visual. Um, we started with one dome, three courts. We now have two domes, six courts, and three indoor mini courts. And again, I think in the whole of the UK over the last decade, there's only been 12 more indoor courts built, and we'll build, we'll build wow. three of them. What, what, what an incredible figure that is, Nick. Yeah, it's a big number, and we know why mm. it's so tough. You know, yeah. It's very expensive, and you've got to have a business behind it to, to justify it. Um, we had no clay courts, and as a top tennis player yourself, you know the value of clay courts. We now have yeah. seven. So we've gone yeah. from zero to seven clay courts, and all the members love those as well. You know, again, we had a, a hard time convincing them to start with that it was a yeah. good idea, but as soon as they start playing on them, they, they love them. Um, and we spent a lot of time, John and I, travelling around the country looking at facilities. We went to Bristol, we went to Newcastle, Manchester, down to Kent, yeah. all looking at stuff yeah. to find out what was best of breed just on tennis court surfaces before we, we, we made some jumps on those things. We've had three floodlit courts. Do you remember, Mike, when we started the first three courts were floodlit? That's right. Of Nine, course. Yeah. 1985, <laughs> I think they were in. We now have eight floodlit and two more going in next week. So we'll have 10. We've gone from three to 10 and all our mini courts are floodlit outdoors. And then the last big one was clearly the, the gym. At one yeah. point, um, I forget exactly when, 2002, we started, we changed the ladies' change room to a, a small gym studio to test it. 
and it worked it did really well um mainly for the children and then the local community wanted to be involved and then we we ended up building a, a bespoke half a million pound gym there's a couple hundred thousand pounds of kit in it all paid for um and servicing 450 members uh, yeah. who use the gym as yeah. well as all the tennis players so it's kind of all working together that produces a really good figure into the main accounts the surplus that helps tennis in, in, in a major way um but everything we've done with the facilities has been based on things that work well together sports that yeah. go well together the culture yeah. the ethos uh, and so on so there's there's some of the big numbers and and nick what would you just as a sort of a headline figure in terms of the actual investment that has gone into those facilities over this sort of 20 year period what, what would you put that at probably about two and a half million two and a half million yeah wow. we have yeah and it's all, all all funded i was going to come on to potentially a few few financial numbers mm. we we started off with about half a million of assets that we had to insure which was mainly the yeah. clubhouse and a couple of old knackered courts we now have a, a property book insurance value of 5.1 million wow so it, it is increased considerably yeah. and almost all of that has been funded through um surpluses that we've reinvested some grants we've been able to attract investment because of the, the way we run things here and the successes uh, of six hundred and fifty thousand pounds over the 20 years in, in bits and pieces but a big number in total um our income has gone from 40k a year to 1.1 million on yeah. a regular basis this is pre-covid of course of course yeah um and our assets we, we've ended up funding it all and still with probably about 350,000 cash in the bank. We, we, we've had a few interest-free loans, of course, during that journey when it's been appropriate to do so with the LTA, which has been great. But the net result is we've, we've got 5 million of assets in pure numbers terms, 350K in the bank uh, and no debt at that point with those numbers. Um, and everything is, is in very good shape. So a lot of it's been reinvested Yes. By having multiple income streams coming yeah. in, all supporting each other, having an environment that attracts people, good people, attracts the investment. Um, you've done a great job. Clearly, 40% of all those numbers comes from coaching. Yeah. And it's a big yeah. number and a big success story with the 15 coaches. Um, so, and even, even with the kids, you look at some of the numbers with the children, six junior Wimbledon players yeah. from nowhere, Two playing senior Wimbledon now, or senior tour tennis, and over thirty have gone to the states um, college. So whichever way we look at it, we're, we're a centre that the numbers we're looking at helping everybody. It doesn't matter who you are and what you are. Um, Twenty seventeen, yeah. so all the normal adult tennis happens in big. You know, if you want to play matches, you want to be a star and go to try junior Wimbledon. There's something for you, etc. The, the whole package, and that's something that we're we're most proud of when you look at these numbers the wealth creation that it's, has gone yeah. on that's enabled everybody to be the best they can be. Yeah. And as yeah. John has always yeah. said, um, what's your famous phrase, John, about the, our first vision? The, um, the opening line? Do you remember? Uh, I, well, it's, it's it, escaped me a moment. Just give me a clue, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a complete it's tennis your, experience. It's, complete tennis, it's the tennis yeah, experience, yeah. John. Right, the complete tennis experience. Yeah, well... That, exactly. That, weirdly enough, that that was uh, that was developed in the early days, uh, and it was in, I, I I was involved in trying to get a conversation around that. But one of our members, who I think moved out to the Middle East, someone called Nicola Pitt, uh, who was in, who who had a kind of marketing background, she came up with that that phrase. I don't, I don't know whether you're aware of that. No, I didn't. No, <laughs> I just remember it was. It, it being a major sea change for us all when we understood that the aim was the complete tennis experience but it was different for everybody yeah yeah that's yeah. right exactly. so when we accepted and understood that yeah that made life so much easier for us in terms of our yeah. operating models and how we went about making decisions yeah. and then we weren't going to please everybody all the time okay. um yeah. but it was definitely yeah. going to be different for everybody and yeah. it just yeah. it almost a sense of freedom yeah, that's right. <laughs> Nick, us all up. I mean, those are some absolutely phenomenal sort of figures. And um, 
And and John, obviously, with your history in uh, in turning businesses around, um, I know that's you know uh, an absolute passion of yours is to is to go in and to look at businesses that are struggling and to see what can be done to actually um, you know get them get them sailing in the right direction again. Um, but John, what would what would you say were the fundamental sort of pillars in turning things around? And what are the sort of the mission critical areas to maintain this trajectory of continued growth and development um, as an organization? Well, the first thing, Mike, is, is, is having access to key human capital. And yeah. the first thing that attracted me and gave me confidence that I could help was the fact that uh, Nick was available, you came on board, you brought James Morgan on board, and we yep. then had a situation where we had Jill Rowe, who at the time was working, I think, for Johnson & Johnson, who was prepared to come and spend a lot of disproportionate amount of her time uh, looking after our financials. Uh, and, and so my first thought was, how could I help these four people, uh, you know, really do something special? And yep. that's my initial attraction to, um, to, to, the, to the project, as you say, that I often call it. There were probably another three fundamental pillars. Um, I think the first one was to move from a kind of inward looking to an outward looking model, mm -hmm. uh, incorporating some you know, good business thinking, some of which uh, Nick has alluded to, um, with, with, with key focus on the customer. Uh, yeah. Nick's just reminded me of uh, that very first work we did to create that vision of creating the complete tennis experience which basically means asking the customer what they want. Yeah. And of course, you know, having said that, it, it did create a few issues for us because as you were saying a few minutes ago, uh, customers want different things. And so we had to figure out how we could create an operating plan to enable us to deliver multi-activity, you know, different products for different customers. Uh, and, uh, and that was a challenge. And it differentiated us from other clubs, other tennis yeah. operations, because the normal standard product there is to join, pay a sub, uh, go and play a game, or um, you know, have, a, have a sort of club night, or join one of the teams. So we wanted to be different. And that was one of the driving phrases that helped us. Um, I think the other thing that was helpful at the time is that we, we needed a compelling vision of what could be. Mm -hmm. and, and to enable us to attract, and particularly to enable us to attract people and investment, which Nick has, has mentioned to, to already. The, the, the other thing that happened uh, was the importance, and this is where I think perhaps the RAF uh, had a few difficulties, because the RAF were very busy doing their sort of day jobs at the time, but we needed to make, we needed people who were on the spot talking to customers and making decisions much closer to, to, to research with, with, with what our customers needed. And I think our decision-making yes. then started to improve. That's the first thing. The second thing is we needed to build a new relationship with the RAF. Yes. Because we were partners with the RAF. Okay, we were tenants, but we were nevertheless, we had a strong relationship with the RAF uh, historically. And I remember them being a bit disappointed with the Halton uh, setup because it was, you know, down at Hill, uh, courts were in bad shape, uh, you know, the loos were awful. And I remember, Nick and I remember asking them the questions, well, what would you like it to be like? How would you feel? How would you like to feel when you brought the army or the Navy down to your tennis center? Yeah. The home for yeah. Our tennis? How would you like to feel? And of course they wanted to feel proud. So then the question was, how could we do that? And we know that we couldn't do it through the old model because we'd got the results of the old models staring us in the face. So we had to think of something new. And I think what happened then um, was that we started to agree a new way of thinking, a new operating model based around trust. You know, the RAF had control. They were concerned about losing that for very good reasons. Mm -hmm. They'd had some bad experiences with another sport where they'd almost been excluded after a period, a transitional period. So we had to build that relationship and that led to a situation where Holton Tennis Centre 
was able to buy or, or, or take on a long lease of 99 years for the for the site, six or seven yeah. years that yeah. we operate, and we could start to think about the future. And we were we were pretty good. And Nick was very helpful to me here because as chairman, uh, without that kind of in-depth knowledge of the, the RAF culture and, and thinking system, I needed help and support to make sure that I I could do that job. And I think overall, uh, it's been it's been pretty successful. Uh, we're just refreshing and renewing that at the moment. Um, and the third thing I think is to, and we've talked extensively about this and practiced it over the years, and that's to build a leadership style and a culture based on total inclusion. Yes. Total inclusion and our ethos, um, which you read when you're driving in, each talented, each different, but all valued is the essence of my thinking. So we, we needed to build a culture based on total inclusion and thinking big, trying things out, learning from experience and learning from failure. And yeah. I think that culture has enabled us to stretch and try things out and get things wrong and try again and get things wrong and then eventually get them right. And um, I think that enabled us to attract ambitious people who were more excited and more interested in going on the journey with us and then moved on to um, to, to getting getting investment, which Nick has already mentioned. So I yeah. think those were the three or four pillars, Mike. I don't know whether that makes no, sense. No, that's, that's fascinating, John. And I think, you know, just first and foremost, the idea back in, you know, 20 years ago in tennis and tennis clubs about talking about the customer was was a brand new thing um and i think also this idea of how we could be really really nimble and quick in our decision making as opposed to perhaps the old model within clubs where you had to wait three three four months till the next committee meeting to make a decision yeah. nick we 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 developed a different yeah. model on that could you just expand on that a little bit please yeah, of course, Mike. I think the something that I brought in, and it kind of suited my personality as much as anything else um, to be involved, I coined a phrase called the, the light hand at the tiller mm -hmm. sort of approach of, of managing. And none of us came into this with an idea of running something and creating something huge. It just kind of evolved. Um, but the idea of being able to tap into lots of people's knowledge and experience on the ground, and obviously we now have 50, but at the time we had half a dozen, um, was a really important feature of what, what we were all about. Um, yeah. And for example, the one, the quote that I always used uh, in this team approach, one of my non-negotiables, and we've talked about it a lot at Holton, is what is the difference between a, a four by 100 meter relay team and the world record fastest guy on his own running around 400 meters? Who's the best? Which would you put your, your money on to win the exactly. race? Yeah. And it's that image that you get the relay right, you get the team right, you're going to win by 40 meters easily. You know, you're going to destroy the world record holder, but you don't get it right. And you start dropping the baton or you run out your lane, do something stupid. then clearly the individual guy is going to win. Um, so which do you go for? Um, so it's a bit more of a high risk strategy, perhaps, yeah. but a bit more complicated. It's another way of describing yeah. it. The way we run Holton is complicated. It could be really easy. We just have an autocratic four man committee, bosh, done. How long we would survive and last before we burned out? Who knows? So I would go for the um, this light hand tiller, the relay version. A bit harder work, a bit more complicated. But if we get it right, we're we're going to smash smash uh, the challenges yeah. out of the way easily. Yeah. Um, and 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 Nick, one of the words you use a lot, uh, which which quite suits me as well, funnily enough, is this idea of uh, evolution, perhaps versus you know, kind of very business-like three to five year plan. So although you're a, a, a business person uh, with great understanding of the numbers and and all of that, you, you tend to sort of work around this idea of evolution and setting the compass, but not necessarily having, um, you know, the, the, the strictest of sort of three to five year type business plans. Yeah, absolutely. I would, yeah. I would make a rubbish accountant, that's for sure. <laughs> and there's two ways about that. Um, I'm a bit of a spender as well. I'm a bit of a risk taker. There's no two ways about that. I, I enjoy all that sort of side of things. Um, but I'm also a sportsman. So I understand, you know, my passion is, is sport, golf, tennis, squash. So I understand yeah. that aspect 
that um, if you just keep hitting the ball back every day, you'll win against a lot of people, but you're not going to beat the ones that you really want to beat. You've got to take chances and have weapons. So all of that comes into my my psychic, I, I, I suppose, um, of, of taking risks as such. But I'm also, I, I think it's fortunate that I have a reasonably numerate mind so I can take the numbers that Jill and the bookkeepers yeah. and the accountants give me and understand them in terms of yeah. a business understanding, not as a accounting understanding. Yeah. I, could, I, I yeah. wouldn't have a clue how to put a balance sheet together, but I can read one really well. Yeah. I know what it yeah. means to me in, yeah. in, in that sense. What are the key numbers to pay attention to? And then you can just distill three to four key things and that kind of sets the vision and the compass to go, you know. It does, but it allows, it allows for me, it allows me to be fluid in my thinking. Yeah. So when we decide, you know, we're, one minute we might be saying, okay, we need to hold on to our money and be sensible, you know, things are not going so well, blah, blah. COVID has just hit us. And then suddenly a £10,000 project comes along that's really important to do. If I've got the right mind on, then accountants in me would say, no, keep the money in the bank, don't do anything, shut down. But my mind is also saying, well, actually, is this an opportunity? Yeah. You know, let, should we, should we go? And I'll take soundings and chances are I'll go for it. And that's yeah. just me in my nature. Yeah. But I'm smart enough not to take risks that would yeah. potentially pole access. You know, I'm yeah. not... And that's where the understanding of money, rather than how to make a balance sheet, uh, created. Where John is the expert at that sort of thing, um, I'm not. Um, so we, we, that's why we, we kind of work well together. I think uh, management accounts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes well. We know exactly what we got. When every month we do management accounts, or like a business, yes, which the tennis club wouldn't normally do. But your yeah. your idea of being agile and nimble and opportunities. Um, is, is bang on. That's exactly where yeah. our brains go. Um, this yeah. COVID period, you know, we're taking advantage of it, of, of the closure when people are here. What can we do while we're closed down? We have a, a very important phrase where we say, can we zig while everybody else is zagging? The zigzag principle. So we do something different. So they're all closing down. We're going to expand. We're going to do something different, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, we just think differently. Yeah, fascinating, Nick and and John. Obviously, your your background uh, has very much been in sort of finance and accountancy, having come from a um, uh, you know a strong sporting background as a soccer player with Coventry City. Um, if I if I got my facts right there, John. Yeah. But again, one of the most important things to you, whilst you have that financial background is what we call culture and this idea of doing things together with passion I think is a term that you you've often used so could you just talk a little bit more John just about this whole idea of culture because when people come down to Holton they can't quite put their finger on it but we we receive feedback so often that says well it's just it's just something about this place. It's just something about the environment. Mm. I don't know if you could unpack that a little bit. And what do you think that just something is? Um, well, just switching back to my own sort of education and experience, although I trained as an accountant after, after breaking my leg playing football, uh, I, I sp- I've spent most of my time um, over the years um, dealing with difficult business problems around the world, you know, ranging mm. from, you know, France, Spain, Italy, all the European countries to the U S and Canada, to Australia, Japan, China. So what I've done is I've, I suppose I've become a student of human behavior and culture. Yeah. yeah. And, um, which includes quite a lot of listening by the way. And, uh, so I, when I came to Holton, apart from my sort of basic training around the the financials, which Nick has mentioned. Um, I I, I had that kind of experience, which which lasted many, many years and and was very, very challenging. So, and the the cultures were different. You know, you could go into Germany with a a proposal and uh, and it would, and the response would be exactly, totally different to what would happen in France or Spain or Italy. And, uh, and you can imagine going into Japan when the business is in trouble. And uh, I'd got a reputation for turning things around and doing well. Going into Japan, uh, 
without fully understanding how to handle that. Now, luckily enough, again, with that situation, I had a good advisor who helped me get through that and uh, stopped me from saying the wrong things. So, so that's the, uh, that's where my interest in yeah. culture came. And so I started to think about it and you know, if you take something like tennis or, or, or sport, you could argue that, that there's, there's a, there are a load of people around who can teach kids how to play tennis. There are a load of tennis clubs around who can offer a tennis product or a tennis experience. It's, 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 not, a, it's not something that's protected intellectually mm-hmm. through some kind of um, patent or anything else. Anybody can do it. Yeah. So the question then is, how can we make us more, ourselves more attractive, more welcoming, more interesting, uh, and that's the culture bit, you know, a shared yeah. way of doing something with passion. So how can yeah. we, how can we do that? And um, I think that, you know, I remember in the early days, Nick, Mike, we, we, when we completed that document, which you've just reminded me about Nick, you know, around the complete tennis experience, we actually had a, a number of, uh, you know, tactics or strategic, uh, strategic items on that list. And one of them was, um, a place where everyone is a host as well as well as a guest. Remember that? Yeah. And yeah, we were challenging absolutely. ourselves, even though we were, you know, long-standing members of um, of Holton, uh, to to be hosts at any time, at all times. And uh, we practiced conflict resolution. I remember James James Morgan being brilliant at that because we had lots of issues when we were making those changes. So culture. Culture, I think, is strategy, Mike. I mean, yeah. you know, sometimes we, th- we think we're bolting it on. You can probably afford to, uh, to ignore it if you've got some, some technical product that's so far ahead of anybody else, you can win the market, you can win market share. Yeah. But if yeah. you haven't, it becomes much more important. And that's why, uh, you know, with your help and Nick's help and, and James mm-hmm. and everybody else, we built this reputation for being incredibly welcoming, incredibly welcoming, and 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 have that sort of can-do attitude. Yes, we can get you playing. I mean, you know, we've got rusty rackets that Nick runs. We've got all the stuff that you've done over the over the years, Mike. So we just made it easier for people to come and enjoy themselves at Holton. But that's culture. Brilliant. Oh, thank you, John. That's a uh, fantastic kind of pick description. Up on that one? Yeah, right. please, Nick. Lovely. Yeah. One of the one of the things when I when I first played here, um, ages, you were judged almost a hundred percent on how good your tennis was, your backhand, your serve. You didn't tend to mix out of the, the smallest group that you play tennis with, whether it was yeah. club nights or matches. And for me, that was one of the major changes and a major part of our success. Talking about what John is saying, everybody welcome, um, everybody valued. And Rusty Rackets is one example. But that that customer coming around the, the corner, the idea of the customer and the next next heartbeat for the club. Yeah, yeah. And I think one thing that we've been very successful at is widening widening our thinking that everybody is is appreciated and valued. It doesn't the, the ability to play tennis is not not the marker anymore. It used to be, as far as I'm concerned, a major marker. Yes. Now it's just yeah. one of them. You know, if you if you're good at tennis, we'll all watch you, and it's great fun. But it doesn't make you any better or different to anybody else. Um, yes. Quite quite the opposite. Um, and obviously, the coaching business, forty percent of our income from that says says a lot for that that sort of culture that people yeah. want to improve. Everybody's welcome. Um, yeah, and and of course, Nick, part of that would be how we have sort of worked with and hopefully treated all our volunteers, and and making it an environment where people actually want to get involved and be part of the club and serve the club, because we have this sort of, I suppose, quasi organisation of professional and volunteer kind of help and support that that makes it all work. You know, you referred to uh, Jill Rowe, who's given you know, 20 plus years of her, of her, you know, professional um, support to us, um, you know, for, for, for absolutely nothing. And, and, and there's people like that who have wanted to come in and contribute because of the love they have for the place that's been so significant. I, I think so. And John, John actually worked it out, the amount of money that it would cost to replace the volunteer workforce here, if we fully professionalized Holton and you're talking a hundred thousand pounds a year to do what they're yeah. doing. 
Um, I think that was the number I think, John, yeah. you, yeah, you yeah. calculated. Yeah. And we are a nice mixture of volunteers. Um, you know, we're not like a, say, a David Lloyd, where everybody is a professional, as far as I understand. And part of our, our job is to create that environment um, that attracts the best people and attracts the volunteers and attracts the investment. And I think the volunteers are in there with the track. Same thing as attracting volunteers is just as important as attracting the best tennis coaches yeah. and, and attracting some cash and some investment. Yeah. It's a, yeah. a bit of a triangle that they have equal importance uh, uh, for us, for sure. That would be my take. But John, you you, you talk a lot about volunteers, yeah. and how important they are, even in the modern era as such. Yes, I do, uh, because um, I think I think you know we all have to earn enough money to pay the bills. I understand that, and the financials are important in that respect. But I think that motivation, people's motivation, comes from something somewhere else. Mm -hmm. We've just we've just uh, we've just gone through this terrible period of the pandemic and 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 uh, clapping the, the nurses and, and 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 thanking them for all the fantastic work they do there's something else that that, uh, that drives people like jill and others to um, to volunteer and we've got loads i could i could list a great name uh, a great list of names i think the i think it's that it's that passion to want to be part of something special it's back to culture really it's um it's doing something with passion yeah. It, it's it's that kind of idea, and the the the, the only thing that I that, that that I the only kind of caveat or or, or caution I would put on the, the whole thing we have to be incredibly careful how we how we bring in our volunteers to make sure that yes. their motivation is to serve. That's the way I put it. Now, you know, people are crazy using that expression, but you know what I mean. As I opposed to yeah. being served, as opposed to you know, self-serving. And, and, and I, I hear stories in many tennis clubs about that behavior yeah. uh, resulting in uh, a kind of more inward focused, uh, you know, process and culture, which is, which can be damaging, but there's no doubt that in our case, Nick, Mike, our volunteers over the years have been absolutely fantastic. And without them, we probably wouldn't be where we are. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it brings us, I suppose, to 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 present day. And and Nick and John, thank you for all of that insight. It's uh, absolutely fascinating, and hopefully, uh, you know, fascinating to those who will be listening to this. Just in terms of, there's going to be, uh, you know, a number of tennis clubs, rugby clubs, cricket clubs, whatever it might be, sporting clubs, and businesses outside of um, sport that are going to be really, really struggling. Um, over the next, you know, six months, couple of years, what what would be sort of in a fairly quick fire fashion? What would be your sort of three absolute key non negotiables that that you might share with those people um, and organisations that would would help them through this this next critical stage of um, of growth, if you like? Can I have four? Great, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably similar to John's anyway, so I'll, I'll kick off. The first one for me is um, to create an environment that attracts the best people uh, and investment. Yeah. So it's that environment. Um, John alluded to the culture, and it's culture eat strategy for breakfast type approach. Um, so creating an environment that attracts the best people, be it the professionals or volunteers, and ergo investment into yeah. the place of yeah. whatever that investment looks like. So that would be my number one. My number two would be something John just alluded to, the leadership style. So those in the leadership positions in the clubs, um, a servant leadership style, the light hand at the um, is, yeah. is critical as opposed to at the other end of the spectrum, a, a sort of autocratic type. Side of Caesar model type of yeah. leadership, yeah. yeah. And then the third thing for me, linking that, the, the people you have working in the club in any kind of position whether they're volunteers professionals whatever got to have the owner's eye attitude yeah it might not be their business but the owner's eye being if they owned it what would they do would they walk past that bit of litter at one end of the spectrum would they make sure they talk to at least 10 people every day yeah not just their own customers or people who are their own standard for tennis or whatever um so that would be my, my second my third one and then the fourth one was i've already mentioned it but this team approach 
you know, everybody talks about high performance teams and so Alex Ferguson, you know, having the best team wins, not just, you might yeah. have a spine of four or five people, um, but it's all about the team, not just a couple of stars in there uh, that could potentially cause, cause uh, dis- disharmony and so on. And I, I use the relay, as I mentioned earlier, yeah. the relay yeah. analogy. So the team approach, so they're my four, if I could steal that extra one, um, the environment, the leadership style, uh, the owner's eye and team approach. They're the four things, the four pillars that if we get right, we're with a sporting chance. Brilliant, uh, Nick. Of non-negotiables. Brilliant, thank you. And and John, is there anything that you would add to that list? Because I know you would subscribe to all of those. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, no, not much, to be honest. But I think Nick's, um, Nick's covered the key points. Um, I think that if, you know, thinking back to your question, Mike, um, of businesses that are in trouble uh, of, as a result of the pandemic, tennis clubs, tennis centres, then, and, and we're involved in this at the moment, and Nick and I are talking about this all the time, is, is that you have to be quick to reinvent. Yes. Uh, you have to tell yourself the truth about the change that's taking place in the world and, um, and start to rethink how to engage with customers and here we are this morning having a conversation using technology, uh, how to engage and deliver some kind of value uh, in a different way to the historic. It doesn't mean to say that we're going to lose, you know, we, we're never going to do it the old way again, but we cannot rely on that as much as we used to. So we have to reinvent, we have to think differently. I, th- I think, I th- sorry, Nick. So you, you, you used to mention right at the early days along that, what would the business look like? I think it was that put us out of business. Yeah. Yes. And, and uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I remember that, that being really important in stopping us getting carried away and thinking we were the bee's knees because we'd had yes. some success. That, that, that exercise that uh, we've done at Holton, I think, and I've done them with many clients over the years, you know, create the business that if it existed would put us out of business. You know, I yeah. did it with Nationwide Building Society and a few other banks and, the, you know, and, um, it's quite a useful exercise actually, because it actually starts to get you to think differently. Unfortunately, without those kind of challenges, we just can we make the assumption that the landscape's always going to be very benign, very friendly. There's not going to be any competitive threats. The market's going to be fine. And you need some other input factor to get you thinking differently. So, and that results in reinvention that results in working out a different model where you can deliver value uh, in, in, in a different way to whatever it, whatever happened before. Particularly challenged with tennis, tennis clubs, because for, for the very obvious reasons. I mean, yeah. you know, lots yeah. of the other big, the big retailers have been able to pivot. They've been able to anticipate, or many of them have anticipated, uh, the, 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 the move to online shopping, things like that. Uh, others haven't. So I think it's that kind of agility. I mean, I think Nick uses the expression a lot, you know, being sp- fast and you 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 talk about it mike quick try it out reinvent learn from experience move on move on move on and i think we do that we do that through teams yeah. we do that by engaging people in, in in practicing teamwork because it's a kind of two and two plus equals five isn't it really where you and and again with with teams we have to be incredibly careful with our language uh, in terms of how we conduct ourselves, how we create an environment in which everyone's comfortable making proposals, coming up with ideas, not being too fearful about, you know, looking stupid or being, you know, being, you know, shouted down. So that's back to culture, back to the environment, which, which, which is, which, which we need to create to, to enable reinvention to take place. Yeah. yeah. That's back to culture. That's why, even though we've got culture eat strategy for breakfast in the conference room, you could argue that strategy is culture. Sorry, culture is strategy. It's strategy. Because yeah. if, if we've got a product where the differentiations are relatively minor compared to our competition, then that, and we, and the, there are certain limitations. We, you know, we're not going to invent a new tennis racket or we're not going to, you know, invent a new product. We've got to win the war, if that's the right way of putting it through culture, through making ourselves more loved, more admired, more attractive, 
and 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 people wanting to hang out with us and and you know and and we've we've coined the phrase making Holton a great great place to be well it's not only a great place to be because it looks beautiful with all the work that's been done on the site but it's a great place to be because of the of the way people engage with you and that's right. back yeah. to you know creating the creating the, the the environment for reinvention yeah well john and nick i mean just just to finish on that note um you say it's a great place to be john and and i fully fully agree with that i also believe it's a it's a great place to become yeah. And um, I have become, through, through the both of you over these last 20 years, um, I was a guy who could hit a few tennis balls and knew a little bit about tennis. And, uh, and, and what I have become is a real student now of leadership, of organizational growth and development. And that's, you know, very, very much down to the two of you and, and, and your time that you've spent. And that's one of the things I think, perhaps if there's anything to distinguish, uh, you know, you know, great leaders, which uh, I believe you both are from others, is is the ability just to give time to people. And the time that you've given me over the years has, has been so significant. So that's massively appreciated. And um, I really, really appreciate the time that you've given uh, to this today and, and very, very much hope that, um, that our listeners really, really appreciate it and enjoy uh, some of the things that you've said. Bye. Can I? Thanks for that. It's very kind of you. Can Can I leave uh, this podcast with 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 an open question for perhaps listeners and clubs out there to consider and think about in the future? And it's it's around um, a comment made by a guy called Lewis, and I think he was might have been the chief exec for the LTA many years ago. Is it Chris Lewis? Or Richard Lewis, perhaps. Richard Lewis, that's the fella. Mm. And it must have been at least fifteen years ago, early on when we were in this project. Yeah. And he made a comment on structure and it was along the lines of the future of, of a sports club particularly tennis clubs will be based around the semi-professional model mm -hmm. and he saw in the future that if you're going to be successful and growth and, and whatever it was providing the customers what they needed the semi-professional route was the way to go yeah and he just made that comment i remember reading it and and he'd obviously been around the world and seen what happens everywhere else in that job he had. And I, I just challenge everybody out there, don't be scared by that idea. Yeah. That would be my challenge yeah. to everybody. Don't be scared by the idea of your club being a semi-professional club. No matter how small you are or big you are, um, as, as a concept, as an idea, see where it takes you. Um, so that, that's my sort of final, final thing, because we've been involved in that yeah. journey. Right. And you wouldn't naturally go that route. It's not something that, oh, that's how we're going to you know, manage this future. But it has evolved and it has happened to us. And I'm personally quite a, a strong believer in it from the experience of 20 years being here that actually that allows you to do all sorts of things that a, a traditional structure definitely does not allow you to do. Yeah. So when you say that, Nick, when you talk about that from semi-professional, uh, you, you're, you're, I presume you're talking about a combination of professionals and volunteers. Is that, you know, that I, I am, John, exactly yeah. that. So the so old we, model, so that's an interesting point you're making because the old model of tennis clubs in the UK is that the, the key to the game is to keep our cost down by only having volunteers. That's the fundamental model. Mm -hmm. And what you're mm -hmm. suggesting is that you'd get better results if you had a combination of that and, and, and professional input. And what, what happens then, Nick, Mike, is that instead of talking about surviving, keeping yeah. things going, which is what the old model does, you know, we've got to sort of not, you know, we've just got to make ends meet. Yeah. You then got a combination where you can actually re, you know, reinvent you know, do things differently, talk about raising capital, talk about all sorts of things. Uh, I mean, the number of times I've been asked to help other clubs in the area to get indoor tennis, and I've, I've had to say to them, well, you know, if you want that, you've got to start to completely, you know, think totally differently. You can't think like a tennis club. Yeah. As we know, yeah. Nick, you know, you, you know, yeah. there's no way you can finance that kind of thing. So you have to have... A, a, a optimistic, but, but at the same time, a kind of creative force, which that could produce. What Nick has described is more likely to say, to, to, to result in, a, in an expansionist kind of system of thinking, as opposed to a survival. 
Brilliant. Gentlemen, I'd like to thank you very, very much. And uh, it's been a real pleasure and um, look forward to the next uh, 20 years with you both. <laughs> <laughs> no chance. Okay. All the Thanks, best. Mike. Thanks very much. Thank you.